Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We've been talking about managing pressure. And we said that pressure is the emotional and mental reaction to the ever-changing activities of life. That pressure is the emotional and mental reaction to the ever-changing activities of life. That means that the activities of life generate pressure. Just understand it that way. That the activities of life does what? It generates pressure. And stress is a physiological response of the body to pressure. By extension, the stress is the harmful resource of negative stress that the body is not able to absorb or to adapt to. And that when the stress is protracted, it can cause sickness and even premature death. And there is so much stress in the land. Your mental attitude, not your circumstances, determines the degree of your pressure. It is not your circumstances in life that determines the degree of the pressure and stress that you go through, but your mental attitude. How are you reacting to issues? So a positive mental attitude is the key to learning to cope with pressure. So that's why it is important that this morning we'll learn how to maintain a good mental attitude. But of course, before we go through that, we need to understand that there are various stages in life that generate pressure. All stages in life generate its own pressure. The first is the childhood pressure that is associated with learning. As kids, the first pressure, the pressure of learning how to walk, how to talk. It starts with crawling, it starts with running, learning to write learning to deal with alphabets and stuff like that. They all generate pressure for the kids. Of course, we have the teenage pressure with its associated rebellion. Then the newlyweds, they also have their own pressure, which is especially finances. They also face sexual pressure. They have the role pressure. Because as newlyweds, they want to exercise their rights and privileges. They tend to want to <laughs> know who is the boss, the various roles they have to play. But I've said it and I'll say it again. That God's original intention and arrangement is that the man is the leader of the family. It is his job to provide it is his job to protect. While the woman is supposed to be the homemaker, she is the mother and the partner in the house. When you mix up these roles, you're signing up for pressure. Then we said that parents also face their own pressures in trying to bring up the children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, training them the way they should go. The man's time, quality time, it will cost you everything. If you don't get your priorities right from the onset, then later in life you're going to regret it. 
And I said in my own family, we were able to get our priorities right. So for the past 20 years thereabout, my wife spent everything trying to bring up these kids. She had to abandon her profession as a pharmacist to take care of these children. And today we are all very proud with their performances. They are doing very well in their various fields of endeavor. So we are not just talking theory. We are, I'm telling you the real practical aspect of running a home. Because the character of the woman is the extension of the family. Once you miss it from that angle, you're signing up for tremendous pressure later in life. There are many homes that spend quality time now in the police station because of juvenile delinquency. But this you can avoid by spending quality time when these kids are still young and molding them. There is no shortcut in training children. You must pay the price. The price of time. To love takes time. To inculcate values, it takes time. To teach children the philosophy of life, it takes time. So at the early stages of marriage, we must make out that time. If you don't, I can assure you, you are going to regret it later in life. You can make money anytime in your life, but you can't train these kids anytime. So that's why it's very, very important that you get your priorities right from the onset and do the needful. Then we said that singles also face pressures. Retirement also has its own pressure. What about dating? It has its own pressure. I thought I would dive into that this morning. But I think I have to keep it for some other day. Or do you guys want me to talk about it? How you should be able to select the right guy. Okay, so let's go there. That's the popular opinion. How do you choose the right guy? There are seven things that you must have to take into consideration and take it seriously. The first one. You need to know your non-negotiables before you start dating. What do I mean by that? You must have one, two, three, four things that you are not prepared to compromise. Take for instance, I don't want somebody that smokes. It becomes your non-negotiable. That means if the guy is smoking, he's out. <laughs> you're looking for a Christian or whatever religion if the person doesn't fall in within that he's out you need a man that has the fear of God in his heart if he's the one that will go to club Sunday morning then he's out don't make the mistake of thinking that, oh, he will, he's going to change. Change to what? So you must have your non-negotiables. If you want kids, then it becomes part of it. Because there are some people that are not prepared to have kids. You have a lot of them abroad. Oh, I just want to get married, but I don't want children. So these are things that you need to know from day one. So if you are the type that you want kids, it's part of your non-negotiable. So if the guy says, oh, well, I'm still considering whether I'm going to have children, then throw him off. It's not part of your equation. Then number two, get to know him by asking important questions early enough and often. Why? 
so that you don't risk wasting your time with somebody that doesn't key in into what you want. So when you ask questions early enough, you get to know the stuff the guy is made of. You don't want to stay around someone that doesn't know what he wants in life, whether he wants to get married or not. That's not the kind of person you hang around with. Young girls, are you hearing me? Number three, don't buy into his projections. Trying to figure out what he has in mind and filling in the blank spaces with what you think. By the time you realize it, it's too late, and you'll be crying and saying, I thought, I thought, I thought, because you've been filling in the blank spaces for the guy. That's why it's important to ask questions from the onset, so that you know his mindset concerning issues. Number four, you have to wait for intimacy. Be patient, don't rush it. I see many young girls, they are very desperate. They want to take 10 steps at a time. So wait for intimacy. Wait for exclusivity. If he's still playing around and he's not giving you the due respect, then it's not your kind of person. Number six. You must realize that friendship is the foundation of any lasting relationship. Let the friendship determine the depth of your relationship. That's why it's important to your patient. Cultivate friendship. Let it be the basis on which you determine your relationship. Lastly, and this is very important, watch his relationship to his responsibility, how he handles his challenges. Does he look for blamers or does he face challenges squarely, head on? When you see any young man that is dodging responsibility, I can assure you that when you get married to him, that's the way he will dodge responsibilities in the house. And then you will start regretting and crying. So when you get some of these things sorted out from day one, it saves you all the heartache. Young girls, are you happy this morning? You've learned something? So we can close this meeting and go. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we are here this morning to talk about how we can manage pressure in life. And we said to maintain a good mental attitude is the key to managing pressure. Please take note of it. Maintaining a good mental attitude is the key to managing pressure. And for you to be able to do that, there are things that you need to learn there are things that you must have to come to terms with. The four things that you need to learn and constantly apply. Number one is that you must know who you are. By so doing, you're dealing with the identity crisis. That means that you must know who you are, where you came from, why are you here on earth, and where you're going when you live here. Those four critical questions, you must be able to find answers to them for you to be able to know who you are. And all over the world, People are facing tremendous identity crisis because they don't know who they are. So this morning, we're going to answer those four critical questions that will help us be convinced who we are. 
that we are not evolving from apes and monkeys. Then number two, in trying to maintain a good mental attitude, is that you must accept yourself as God made you. It is very important. You must come to terms with the psalmist, Psalm 139, verse 14. It says, I will praise the Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth it right well. You must come to terms with that fact that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are going to look at that in details. Then number three, you need to develop a thanksgiving attitude. Then number four, you need to learn to be content where you are. Learn to relish today. The psalmist in 118.24 said, This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So learn to enjoy the day through thanksgiving, through praise, and through contentment. So too many times we believe that when we have enough money, then we are going to be happy. But I tell you this morning, it is not how much money that you have, but how much money means to you that makes the difference in life. Did you get that? It is not how much money that you have. It is how much money means to you that makes the difference. That's why you have misers. Money means so much to them. They don't spend. They don't eat. So they still die poor. So mental attitude is the most important factor in handling pressure. We are told in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So we're going to now examine those steps that I mentioned. And I said that the first is to know who you are. And how do you do that? We need to answer the four questions. The first one, who are you? John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13 said that, but to all who believe him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. That tells me that you are a special creature of God. That's one aspect. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. So when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you now become the child of God. So there is a great difference between being a creature of God and a child of God. You graduate from being a creation of God into being a child of God. All the people are creation of God, but not all of them are children of God. Children of God are those people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ. When you make him your personal Lord and Savior, that's when you become his kid. So this fact should influence your thought and your every action. When you're conscious of the fact that you are the child of the Almighty God, 
It helps you to confront the difficulties and challenges and pressures of life, knowing that your heavenly Father is always with you. Because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even unto the end of the ages. Number two, where did you come from? That's the second question that you need to settle. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we are told, In the beginning the world already existed. He was with God and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing existed that he did not make. So now we know who created the world. We came from the Father. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. It says there that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made anything at all and is supreme over all creation. Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. Have you seen it? So Christ created everything. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, kings, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. Everything has been created through him and for him. So now you know where you come from from the bosom of the Heavenly Father. Why I'm stressing this is because if you don't realize where you come from, then you will continually have that identity crisis. Are you guys following me? So it's very important to we'll get some of these facts resolved once and for all. In the so-called civilized world, do you know that the major problem they are having today is this issue of identity? And because of identity crisis, they get involved in all kinds of things. When you realize that you are a creation of Almighty God made in His image and likeness. There is no way you're going to hold fellowship with a dog or pussycat. There is no way you will abuse God's natural cause of relationship and get into affection, man with his fellow man and woman with his fellow woman. All those crazy stuff are as a result of identity crisis. They don't know where they came from. They don't know who they are. Because when you do, there are a whole lot of things that you will not do. When you see somebody killing in the name of whatever, it shows that the person has identity problem. Because when you realize that your fellow human being is created in the image and likeness of God, you don't want to take any person's life. So when you see people slaughtering others, it's because they have identity crisis. Are you guys hearing me? Why am I here? Paul affirmed that he was on earth to serve his Lord. So you must know why you're here. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. That's a profound statement. And it can only come from somebody that knows why he is here. He said, I have fought the good faith. I have finished my course. Finishing his course 
means that he had an assignment. For you to say I've finished something, that means that you know what you're doing. You know where you started. For you to say I've finished. If you don't know where you started, can you know when you finish? So this statement can only come from somebody that has an assignment. He said, I have kept the faith. Then in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says there, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. God has a plan. Tell your neighbor, God has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. So you should not pass this planet at an ordinary person. He said in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They are thoughts of good and not of evil. Because I have an expected end for you. And we call it destiny. But whatever name you like, you can call it. The most important thing is that God has a plan for your life. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it says we are Christ's ambassador. When you hear the word ambassador, what comes to your mind? A representative of his country in a foreign land. That means that here is not our permanent home. We are representing Christ here on earth. And as an ambassador, when you finish your assignment, you go back home. And I said that too many times. If you perform poorly and got into trouble in, in your assignment, when you get back home, you're going straight to prison. So right here on earth, Life that God has given to us is an opportunity for us to decide where we are going to spend eternity. Whether we are going to spend it with him in heaven or in hell with the devil. So make no mistakes about the religious teaching that any person can pray you out from purgatory to heaven when you die. It's not scriptural any longer. There was that dispensation when there was purgatory. But we are told that he led captivity captive. When he died, he went into hell and released all the people that the devil held bondage and took them to glory. Amen? Amen. Ever since then, purgatory was abolished. And we are told that it's appointed unto man once to die after that judgment. And I said that that judgment for a child of God is not as to punishment. That judgment is as to reward. Just like we have the governors and judges in an inter-house spot. They are not there to punish the athletes. They are there to award them based on their performances. And Christ said, I go prepare a place for you. When it's ready, I'll come for you. Because in my Father's place, there are what? Many mansions. And I said, anywhere you find mansions, you find boys' quarters. And for some of you that are not performing, allowing our seats to be empty, when you leave this planet Earth, straight to boys' quarters, that's where you're going. Amen? But for those of us that are preaching good, the mansions are waiting for us. There is the crown of glory that is waiting for us. Amen? Number four, where am I going? I've already explained it that one of the main reasons why Christ came was not just for the forgiveness of our sins, 
But most importantly for our salvation and also for us to inherit eternal life. So life does not stop here on earth and it will never end here on earth. We are going somewhere someday. And when the trumpet shall sound, we that are in Christ, that are still living, will be caught up in the sky with him. And the dead in Christ will all be risen. Amen? That is our hope, and that is our glory. So here is not our permanent place of abode. So Paul writing to his son Timothy in Timothy 2, chapter 4, verse 8, he says that, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that great day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his glorious return. So there is a day that there will be no more weeping. A day that we will be caught up in the sky with him if we are still alive when he comes. Hallelujah. Are you glad? You now know that you didn't come from apes and monkeys. You are the child of the living God. Hallelujah. So we said that number two on how to be able to maintain a good mental attitude is for us to accept yourself as God made you. We've seen it. The psalmist said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul know it right well. Your ability to accept yourself makes all the difference. Your ability to accept your looks, your talents, your family, your environment, and your future will definitely influence your relationship to God, to people, and to everything that you do in life. If you're not too tall, you don't need to go and buy a six inches heel. One day you miss your step and break your ankle. I said it, my dad is a six-footer, handsome with pointed nose. My mom, in chumic. And this nose that you see here, I inherited from my mom. I never liked this nose. Because of that, too many times, I don't want to look at myself in the mirror. That was in those days. Because I don't like what I see. So I, I kept wishing I had my daddy's nose. I kept wishing I was a little bit taller. Until I see the trauma that tall people go through sitting in the plane. You know the gap is very short. They're always very uncomfortable. Some of them will opt out to go and stay by the exit door because it has enough gap. And they will be teaching them how to open the door in case of emergency. Did I enter the plane for emergency? You know, if there's any emergency, you're gone. <laughs> Amen? And like I said, until I had my two boys, they're now very tall with pointed nose. So anytime I remember them, I smile. I said, Daddy, at least you've paid me back good. So I accept your looks. Don't waste so much of your money in perfect finish. You know, too many times you see people, they rub all those things. But it demands that you have an air-conditioned car. Because some of those finishing products, they don't like heat. So when you buy it without a car, and you apply it because you see others apply it, 
By the time you're through struggling for boss and co, sweating, you just find out that your face will look like that of a masquerade because all the shade of colors that you have put there will mix together, stain your dress and stuff like that. Women are not happy. I'm just trying to help you save some money. Enjoy whatever you see on the mirror. That's what God designed for you. Are you guys hearing me? Be happy with it. Appreciate him for it. And talking about talents, you see a lot of people. Like me, I wanted to be an engineer. But by, I wouldn't know. The teachers were not there. No physics teacher, no chemistry teacher, no math teacher. I had to read the one that I could. I ended up being an accountant. So ordinarily, by talent, I'm supposed to be an engineer. I'm supposed to read the sciences. But guess what? All my kids have tended towards that. Maybe because of their mother, I don't know. But I know that I had the talent of reading sciences. But situation. But should I dwell on that and begin to regret? The answer is no. There are things you cannot change because of the ingredients that God put into your genes. So whatever looks that you wear now, accept it. And it will save you a whole lot of pressure. So for most people, their greatest difficulty is their looks and their talents. This is unfortunate because we are designed by God's creative manipulation of the genes at the time of conception. That's why the psalmist said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Is that okay? So just simply accept what you see. The mirror image does not tell any lies. In Isaiah chapter 45, verses 9 to 10, it says, Disruption is certain for those who argue with their creator. Hmm. Does that ring a bell to you? Destruction is what? Is certain for those who argue with their creator. Those that go for plastic surgery. Many of them, they've lost their lives in the process. I'm sure you know of one or two people, very influential and popular people. They were not satisfied with what God gave to them, and they decided to go and do their own. Some will even change, want to change their sex to become something else. Then it says there, does a clay pot ever argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim and say, how clumsy can you be? How terrible it will be if a newborn baby said to his father and mother, why was I born? Huh? Why didn't you make me this way? You all know of the saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You are as beautiful or handsome as you think you are. That's why in Proverbs 23, 7, he said, As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So we can preserve our looks and upgrade our skills but we can never change the basic ingredients. It's still there, no matter the plastic surgery. If you're not careful in the process, you will lose your life. Always remember Psalm 84, verse 11. No good thing does he withhold from those whose work is blameless. God will never withhold any good thing from you. So whatever... He has given to you by bet. Accept it and thank him for it. Don't try to add or subtract anything. Just say, Lord, I thank you. If I'm short, I'm short for a purpose. 
Just accept it and thank him. If I'm too tall, thank him, accept it. If you're too fat, thank him and accept it. But if you can do anything about it, fear and good. If you can't, just simply thank him. I'm not blaming him that I'm not an engineer. Circumstances could change some things in your life. So, but for you to be happy, just always be conscious of Psalm 84 verse 11, that God will never withhold any good thing from you. Is that okay? Then number three, we said develop a thanksgiving attitude. We are talking about maintaining a good mental attitude. So one of the things that you need to do is for you to develop a thanksgiving attitude. There are only two kinds of people, grippers and tankers. I want you to take note of that. There are only two types of people on planet Earth. Grippers and what? And tankers. Grippers are never happy. Tankers are always happy. And then Psalm 1, verse 1, God warns us against sitting around with creepers. Take note of that. Because evil association corrupts good manners. It corrupts good character. So in line with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, we must build our activity. And what did he say there? No matter what happens, always be thankful, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So some of us want, we want to know the will of God. They will come to you. I want to know the will of God for my life. This morning you have known it. The will of God for your life is for you to be what? Thankful. Always. Tell your neighbor, always. 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 Be thankful. I didn't say some time. So developing a thanksgiving mental attitude is not only the will of God for your life, but it's, it is the secret to developing a positive mental attitude, which in turn is the key to controlling pressure. Developing a thanksgiving mental attitude is not only the will of God for your life. It is the secret of developing a positive mental attitude, which in turn is the key to controlling pressure. So how do I develop a thanksgiving mental attitude? To be thankful is not an easy thing. You need to develop it. And it's not a one-off event. It must be a lifestyle. Tell your neighbor, it must be a lifestyle. For you to always be thankful. For you to always be grateful. When you do that, it relieves you of a lot of pressure. So what is the first thing that you do? How do I develop a thanksgiving mental attitude? Number one, do a daily Bible study on all the verses related to thanksgiving. Write down your findings. Do a daily Bible study on all the verses related to thanksgiving and write down your findings. Then number two, memorize one Thanksgiving verse per week, starting with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Try to memorize it, because in the process, you will be able to send it into your heart by the process of meditation. Number three, make a list of 10 characteristics 
If you're married, about your spouse. If you're single, the closest relative or friend. Giving thanks for each one daily for the next three months. Did you get it? Just pick one person that you know, assuming you're single, that is close to you. Write down 10 characteristics of that person and begin to give thanks for it every day for the next 30 days. Remember, we are trying to develop the attitude of thanksgiving. Number four, make a list of 10 other items for which you are grateful, thanking God for them daily. Make a list of 10 other things that you are grateful, thanking God for it daily. We can do a little exercise on that now. Chuka, what is one thing that you are grateful to God about? Just mention one. Thank you. Thank you. Friday, what of you? Life. Huh? Life. Life. Okay, madam. One thing that you are grateful, yes? For being close to God. For being close to God. What of you? For being healthy. For being healthy, okay. You? Life. Huh? For the life you should be, because you passed through that last week. <laughs> Sandra, what of you? For for health. for health, Cedric. My wife. For your wife, I'm glad to hear that, <laughs> Chief. For my family, my family. For the family you came from. Thank you. Can you see how easy it is? So make a list of 10. You just mentioned one. That you're grateful to God for. And continue to thank him every day for those things. That's the way you cultivate and develop an attitude of thanksgiving. Your robots are very good at thanksgiving. They thank you for everything. Virtually everything. They will thank you for what you have done. They will thank you for yesterday. They will thank you for day before yesterday. They will thank you for uh, last year. Uh, they will thank you for spending your money. Are you following? That's a heart of gratitude. Cultivate the habit. No matter how little the thing is, thank God for it. For the kids, you ought to thank God for your parents continually. For paying your school fees. For disciplining you. Thank. Then lastly, and this is critical and important. Do not permit your mind to think negatively, critically, or ungratefully. And never repeat such thoughts verbally. This is huge. Do not permit your mind to think negatively, critically, and ungratefully, and never repeat such thoughts verbally. Too many times we criticize our government and we repeat it verbally. <laughs> Amen. So I'm number one culprit. So I'm going to do something about it. Let them do their own henceforth. Is that okay? I will refuse to bother with them. You know why? Because whatsoever a man sow it, that he will reap. Quit complaining about what they are doing. They are all going to pay dearly for it. There is no ogre bag in it. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You sow bad leadership, you're going to reap it. You steal government's money, you're going to pay for it dearly. That's why a lot of them end up with terminal ailment. Go and check most of the people. 
that carried the country's money. Many of them don't die well. Begin to take a list of them. Make a note of them. Because when you do, you send a lot of people to their early grave. So there is no way you can die peacefully. When you sit down and carry the wealth that belongs to other people, you will pay dearly for it. So if you do, did you get that question? Do not permit your mind to think negatively, critically, or ungratefully, and never repeat such thoughts verbally. But if you do, that means if you have been doing that, repent as soon as you realize what you have done. Anytime you criticize, anytime negative thoughts run through your mind, anytime you're ungrateful for what people have done for you, repent as soon as you realize it by one, confess it as sin. Two, replace the thought with something for which you are truly grateful. Then lastly, quote one of the Thanksgiving verses you have memorized. You see why you need to memorize? Did you get the step? Assuming you have missed it, the first thing you do is to repent. Then confess it as sin. Then replace that thought with something for which you're truly grateful. Then put out a Thanksgiving verse that you have memorized. So without consciously practicing Thanksgiving, you will never develop a lasting positive mental attitude. So it's something that you must do consciously if you want to develop a positive mental attitude. You must practice thanksgiving for everything. Another way that you will practice it is for every hour, find out from yourself how many thanks have you given and how many have you received. One of my young nephews told the uncle when that one was accusing him of being disrespectful, he turned around and said, Uncle, have I ever thanked you? He said, now I'm 25 years old. Have I ever thanked you? That one said, hmm? He said, yes. I'm asking you. I'm now 25 years old. Have I ever thanked you? I know some of you don't know the import of that. It means that the uncle had never done anything for him that warrants him thanking him. So in other words, why should I respect you? So make sure that you earn thanksgiving from people every day and you only do that by doing good works. Is that okay? So any day you go to bed, and you can't remember any person thanking you for anything. Just know you just wasted that day. You don't need to do big things for people to tell you thank you. Just those small little things. Try and put a smile on somebody's face. Then lastly, we'll be closing now. Learn to be content where you are. Learn contentment while living in the midst of intolerable circumstances. When Paul wrote Philippians chapter 4, he wrote it in prison. <laughs> Some of you are surprised. Contentment makes the unbearable bearable. I know you'll be wondering, what is the meaning of contentment? It simply means satisfaction. When you're satisfied, 
It makes the unbearable bearable. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Yet true religion with contentment is great wealth. True religion with contentment is what? Is great wealth. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says there, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, I will never leave you, never will I forsake you. So if you go now to Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, I told you Paul wrote it in prison. He said, I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You know, we often quote that, I can do all things through Christ. It's not scripture for quote, you know, it's for practice. What it means is, whatever situation you find yourself, remain grateful to God. Don't complain, don't grumble, don't grieve. Paul learned contentment in prison. Some of you might say, oh, that's his prison. Did he deserve to be there? The answer is no. He was simply preaching the gospel. He wasn't offending anybody, but they put him in the dungeon. But I can tell you that today, that many of us are in one prison or the other. For some of us, our prison might be barrenness. For some, it might be a job well beneath your ability and your income needs. For some, it might be unemployment. For others, it might be a car without spare tire. You're laughing. One of my friends in those days, he had a car without spare tire. In fact, the tires he had were all also worn out. So before we go out for any meeting, we'll take our time to pray, trusting God that nothing will happen to those tires. And when we come out from the meeting, the first thing we do is to look around. We say, boy, go through that side. If you're following us, you don't even understand the slangs. It means go and check out the tires on your side to make sure that they are still standing. And when we get back home, we thank God that the car brought us back. Because if anything happened, no spare tire, we don't even have money to even walk on the bad tire. As it were, it was a prison. For some, your prison might be lack of accommodation. Others, complete lack, you can't meet your needs. Bachelorhood can also be a prison. But what God is saying in need, be content. So whatever is the predicament, learn satisfaction by developing a thanksgiving attitude where you are. So no matter the situation that you're facing in life, learn to be grateful. He said, in all things, give thanks. He didn't say for all things. You're already in it. There is nothing you can do, but you can praise yourself out of the situation. Amen? God wants to teach you contentment. 
Therefore, learn your lesson as quickly as possible so he can speed you out where he wants you to be. <laughs> For you to be promoted to another class, madam, the person must pass where he is. Am I right? So whatever situation that you find yourself, learn contentment there. God might be teaching you that lesson. And until you pass it, you will not come out of that situation. That's what I meant by God wants to teach you con contentment. Therefore, learn your lesson as quickly as possible. If you pass the exam, then he will promote you out of that situation. So your present circumstances may not be rosy, but they are your training ground. Is that a very good consolation? Tell yourself, I'm just simply undergoing training. <laughs> Amen. Amen? So thanking God for your present address in life is the first giant step toward learning contentment. You know your address right now. Whatever situation you are in now, as it were, that's your address. And they know the banks will, if they want to trace you, they will say, where is the nearest bus stop <laughs> to your house? <laughs> that means that your house is not easily identifiable. So whatever is your present address in life today, learn contentment. Learn to be satisfied. And when you do, the God of peace and mercy will definitely see you through because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the Seven Option Park, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.